Welcome to my Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 6, Guns for Hire Review, or as I like to call it, the Celebrity Guest Star of the Week. I'm officially worried about The Mandalorian as a TV series. This is the second week in a row now where we have sort of a cameo guest star. Last week was fine. It was just a, an old Saturday Night alumni, which is pretty cool, a short little cameo. But this week we have Jack Black and Lizzo and Christopher Lloyd, and not just a cameo, but Lizzo and Jack Black are playing like co-rulers of this planet where the Night Owls have kind of set up sort of base camp and Christopher Lloyd is running the whole like sort of security system overseeing all of the droids that do all the manual labor for the society on this planet. Bo-Katan has come here to talk to the Night Owls because she's gone out to recruit Mandalorians scattered about the galaxy to come back home and join with the watch to try to retake Mandalore. First order of that business is obviously seeking out her old night owls to abandon her, trying to convince them first. And Din Djarin and Grogu are accompanying her on her mission. I mean, I don't know why they're there. They weren't given this mission, but <laughs> they're there. They arrive at this planet, and instead of being able to go talk to the night owls, they're summoned to the palace to meet the, the rulers, which turns out to be Lizzo and Jack Black. Now, when you strip away the Celebrity of the Week stuff, there's an interesting story here underneath. Now, there are some shows where Celebrity of the Week works as a format. Columbo, arguably one of the greatest TV shows of all time, was a Celebrity of the Week show in many ways. The celebrity was usually being the murderer, pitted against Columbo in the episode. Star Wars, however, is a science fiction story with mythological undertones. If you go back to how this whole journey began, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, up front we were told this is an ancient story. Is it a history? Is it a legend? Is it a myth? That's up to the viewer. So it was immediately framed in that sort of mythological-esque kind of construct. So having Celebrities of the Week suddenly show up in TV shows just really takes you right out of what you're supposed to be experiencing. Now, I don't begrudge Jack Black or Lizzo or Christopher Lloyd. If I'm an actor and my agent calls and says, hey, do you want to be in a Mandalorian episode? I'm going to say yes. Just about every actor is going to say yes. Why wouldn't they? I mean, who wouldn't want to be in Star Wars? But it really breaks the sort of story vibe that we're supposed to be getting in this whole Star Wars franchise. As I mentioned, underneath the you know obvious Jack Black Lizzo, um, there's some interesting things happening here. Jack Black is playing a former Imperial who has been another one who has been rehabilitated. Lizzo, I believe, is playing like the royal princess. She's a member of the royal family of this planet. And they fell in love and are married now. And they kind of oversee a society that's really a leisure society because they have old droids left over from the empire days and the separatists like battle droids and everything uh, running all the manual labor for them now some of the humans actually have jobs so they don't really go into why this particular group of humans is working when all the rest of them aren't i don't know if it's a caste system in their society that they just don't mention or it's just one of those things where I'd, those pay no attention to the logistics of that we didn't bother thinking of that so we're just ignoring it we learned from Jack Black and Lizzo that there's been a mysterious um, happenings with all the support droids, the battle droids. Every once in a while, they're, one of them freaks out and goes outside of what their program is supposed to be, and people are getting hurt. And because of the restrictions put on them by the New Republic, because of Jack Black's imperial past, they're not really allowed to have a standing army. So they kind of have the night owls there as sort of hired mercenaries that can protect the planet and then also go off and do bounties and everything but they can't use them internally like as a police force because of the way the new republic's rules and regulations go bo katan is told by these two that you want to be able to go talk to your old buddies you got to solve this droid mystery for me first. So then the rest of the episode actually turns into what feels like an old Clone Wars episode. I really liked it once we got into investigating the mystery of what's going on with these droids. That whole part of the episode was great. Again, it legit felt like we were back 
in the Clone Wars animated series, just live action. It was a nice change of pace to get what felt like a classic Clone Wars show. Now, Bo-Katan and Din Djarin kind of go into this assuming the droids are up to no, no good. Din Djarin obviously already has a long-standing animosity with droids, so he doesn't believe that they're not deliberately doing this. But when they go and they find this sort of card that leads them to a droid bar, which is really cool, like throwback to the cantina on Mos Eisley, we learn from the bartender there, the droid bartender, that the droids are very worried about what's happening because they're afraid the New Republic is going to come and take them and destroy them for scrap metal because that's what's been happening to a lot of the old, particularly the old battle droids from the Separatist days and everything. The New Republic is getting rid of all those things rather than reprogramming a lot of them. So a lot of these droids have kind of found their way here and they have this sort of almost underground society and almost culture and civilization. They're beginning to develop as a people, even though they're droids. They're hopeful that Bo-Katan and Din Djarin can figure out what's going on as well because they're built to serve and they want to continue serving. That's their purpose in their view. And they're happy to serve. And they're worried that whatever is going on with some of their droids that they're going to cause them all to be destroyed. The droid bar serves the droids this sort of viscous liquid that's designed to lubricate their parts and keep them functioning and working. And they discover that one batch of this sort of liquid or oil or whatever it is, is tainted. Something's been manipulated in it. And they take it to one of the other humans who does actually work. And she runs a, an analysis on it, and they discover that these tiny little nanobytes in it, and those nanobytes are changing the programming of the droids who consume that particular batch. And then they can trace that batch back to, okay, who acquisitioned that particular batch? And it turns out to be Christopher Lloyd, the guy running the whole, overseeing the whole security sort of droid system. And he's got this big red button that he had on his desk that we saw earlier that he says if he presses it, every droid will kind of just shut down. That's like the fail-safe mechanism to protect the society in the event of a droid uprising, if you will. But when they confront him, we learn that he's an old separatist, like a big acolyte of uh, Dooku. And he's, you know, the Dooku is right. He was just trying to do right by all the people who didn't want to bend their knee to the old republic didn't want to bend their knee to the empire, don't want to bend their knee now to the new republic. They just want to be left alone. And he's of that vein. And he's kind of doing this as his own little separatist rebellion against what he just sees as meet the new boss, same as the old boss when it comes to the new republic. And we learn now that the button doesn't actually shut all the droids down. It actually turns on that sort of rogue programming to turn every single one of them violent. And he's threatening to just press the button if they don't just let him do his thing, which obviously is not going to happen. And Bo-Katan and Din Djarin make quick work of basically getting him away from the button and arresting him. And then we're back to the celebrity of the week stuff again. We're back to Lizzo and, and Jack Black. And it's so schmarmy and just so just silly. You know, and I don't begrudge anyone who enjoyed it or was tickled by it and like wants more of that. Everyone has their own things that they like. For me, it just took me completely out of the story. It was not easy when I saw Samuel L. Jackson stroll on camera <laughs> during the prequel trilogy because it's hard not to see Samuel L. Jackson. And it took a long time for me to see Mace Windu instead of Samuel L. Jackson playing Mace Windu. But eventually I did over time. And the Clone Wars animated series went a long way towards making that happen, actually. And then we're finally on to the whole reason Bo-Katan came here in the first place, which was to go talk to the Night Owls. So Bo and Din and Grogu go out to talk to them because they've set up, they've got this sort of tent field and sort of simple buildings out there where they're all, for some all reason, they're all just standing around in a big giant field in little groups. No idea, maybe it's lunchtime, who knows. But she goes up to Axe Woes who's the leader of the Night Owls now, 
and they kind of have it out. So she's like, I'm back from my fleet. And he's like, it's mine now. What are you going to do about it? And Bo and Axe have a knockdown, drag out fight <laughs> between the two of them, which I actually quite enjoyed. It's really cool. Get to see two Mandalorians, jetpacks on, like flying and kicking and biting, you know, doing all, not biting, but doing all sorts of stuff. It was a cool fight. You know, they're doing a really good job um, this season of the live action Mandalorian, like physical movement. It's particularly fighting in the air and stuff. They've done a lot of work to get that to really look good. Eventually, back and forth, back and forth, Bo Katan subdues Axe Woves and demands he basically capitulate. But his point is, you're never going to be our leader. You lost the dark saber. You know, it was handed to you in the past. You weren't worthy of it. And it cost us our planet. So if you can't even do that, if you can't even win that saber back, you know, why would anyone follow you? And this is when we get our kind of out of left field. <laughs> Din Djarin is like, well, wait a minute. The dark saber can only be wielded by someone who defeats its current owner. And they're like, yes. And he's like, I went to Mandalore and I was defeated by this creature there and it captured and imprisoned. And he took the dark saber from me. So wouldn't he become the owner of the dark saber in that circumstance? And they were like, we would. And then Din is like, Bo Katan came and she defeated the creature and winning my freedom. So wouldn't the dark saber ownership pass to Bo Katan since she defeated the one who defeated me? So isn't it her dark saber legitimately now anyway? Shouldn't she have it? And they all kind of like looking at each other and they're like, well, actually, yeah, <laughs> actually that, that, that does uh, mean that she should be its rightful owner. So Din hands it over to her. So yes, she's being handed the dark saber a second time. However, by their own rules, she did win it based upon how their rules go. When I was first watching this, I was like, well, wait a minute. When did the Darksaber rules turn into like um, Wizarding World Wands? But this is something that they did actually legitimately establish already in this show. That it has to be one. It's something that was established back in the, the animated, different animated series as well. So it's something that they didn't just pull out of a hat just because they didn't want to have these two characters fight each other. It's something that they had already done the work to establish the rules of and the rules that were actually met here. It just took Din Djarin like noticing like, hey, wait a minute. You know, if you're so hung up on this stupid thing, it's like it doesn't mean anything to me. But if you guys are so hung up on it by your own rules, it's hers, not mine. What I don't understand here is the Dark Saber has been rejecting Din Djarin from day one right after he won it from uh, Moff Gideon. We saw in the Book of Boba Fett, two Mandalorian episodes, that the Darksaber was rejecting Din. So they never explained that, and it doesn't look like they are going to explain why it was rejecting him. The armorer's opinion was that it was rejecting him because he took his helmet off. But that, that has nothing to do with the Darksaber. So we've gotten no explanation still as to why it was rejecting on Din Djarin when he was trying to wield it. But just one of those things that it was there and they seem to have forgotten about it. But she's now in possession of the Darksaber, reclaims her fleet, rec reclaims the Night Owls as hers, and she convinces them that we have to band together with even the crazies over there in the Watch if we want to retake Mandalore and reestablish Mandalorian society properly. They agree to give it a shot. And that's pretty much how the episode ends. So a really good episode where really important things happened. And getting to see the whole, this underground droid society, this culture being born in front of us or underneath the surface with most people not noticing um, was really good stuff. Like That I want more of because, again, it felt much more like an old Clone Wars, you know, kind of throwback episode, which is in a good way. This show just continues to frustrate me, though, because they just can't help themselves with this, like, Jack Black and Lizzo and Christopher Lloyd and all that stuff. Like, ooh, look at this, you know? When you have this really interesting actual story and plot, you know, pay more attention to the actual interesting world-building 
and dynamics going on. Pay less attention to the glitz stuff. But I get it, marketing and all those things. You know, Lizzo in it is probably going to bring more people who may never watch Star Wars, but they're big fans of Lizzo. People, Jack Black's going to bring in Jack Black fans who don't watch Star Wars, but they're Jack Black fans. So I get the angle, but it's just very frustrating as a Star Wars fan because we had some really good stuff just packaged in this glitzy celebrity glam crap. And this is what frustrates me about this show. So I hope we are done with Celebrity Appearances of the Week for this season. There's only two episodes to go. So we now need to get to like the heart of what this whole season was about. <laughs> I hope that's it. Because if there's another third episode in a row with Celebrity Appearance of the Week, then I just, I'm, I'm not done with the show because I want to see the season through the end, but I'm going to be less invested in it if it just this keeps happening. If you haven't seen my reviews for the prior episodes of season three, you can click on the screen here and I will see you in the next video.